Greetings, Trinitarians. This podcast is possible partly because of Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary in Evansville, Indiana. If you're interested in beginning your theological academic journey at Trinity, contact us at Trinity Sem, that's Trinity S E M dot E D U today. Greetings and welcome to another edition of Trinity Radio. I'm Jonathan Pritchett, and along with me is Braxton Hunter. And Yes, we are in my office today. There uh, has been a series of unfortunate events. When Braxton was in Turkey, he ran up an enormous debt, blew all of our money. We had to sell our set and all of our good equipment to pay for his Turkish baths and his fine dining. And all I that. did have Turkish baths, but that's not what this is about. They're doing construction on the other side of the campus, and so today we had to abandon the Trinity Radio Studios, and we have lowered ourselves to Jonathan Pritchett's meager office. And so, um, but if the audio quality is not as great, that's because we're using an onboard uh, mic today. So for the audio listeners, I'm so sorry about that. But I think we're going to have some good content as today we talk about. Death. We got Dr. Braxton Hunter, pretty talented and well-known apologist, shared the stage with the William Lane Craigs to the Mike Laconas to all those guys. Jonathan Pritchett, Dr. Pritchett is here and he is a New Testament guy, does a lot of stuff, a lot of podcasts, a lot of debates, so on and so forth. You can go out of this room tonight and be a Christian apologist. Now, it may not be that you're able to give the answers. But you know, you can be immediately, when we're done here tonight, you can be an answer finder for people. We need to stand up and tell men, and, and more and more women, God is smarter than you. And there are consequences for all of these actions. So why don't you stop for a moment and think, you don't know what's best for you compared to what God knows is best for you. And we're back. And today we're going to be talking about death. This is a good time to talk about death, because you're going to see a lot of death on Halloween. You know, yes, this is being of death. filmed yeah. on the day of Halloween. Yes, so a day late than what we normally film. Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah. It'll still maybe come out uh, the same day. So you may be seeing this the same day. If it's Halloween of 2018, then you're yeah. seeing this on the day we filmed or it. Or Reformation Day. According to Dr. George Ritchie, death is nothing more than a doorway, something you walk through. And according to Gandalf from Return of the King, end? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we all must take. The gray rain curtain of this world rolls back and all turns to silver glass. And then you see it, white shores and beyond, a far green country under a swift sunrise. What both of those quotes are pointing to is that there is a consciousness that survives the body's expiration. Naturally. Right, yes. <laughs> Not so naturally. Uh, now, interestingly enough, there are uh, Christians who would agree with atheists on that not being the case. Christian physicalists. Yes, would say, along with atheists, that when you're dead, you're dead. And now the Christians yeah. would believe in a resurrection, but they don't believe that you go, that you have a do you know another substance? You know they're not substance dualists, so they don't believe that you have your, your spirit or your soul, whatever language you want to use, goes to the immediate presence of the Lord consciously. Right. They, they want to believe that that you're essentially what the atheist believes. Mm-hmm. There's nothing, and then the next thing you'll experience will be the resurrection. Right. Now the atheist, the only difference there is that there is no resurrection for the atheist. Right. So. Right. It may be shocking for some to hear, especially if you're not a patron, because we did a whole episode on uh, Christian physicalism uh, for the patrons. Um, It's still there. If you become a patron, you can go and access that file, and we would love for you to do that. If you're the kind of person who would buy us each cups of coffee once a month, then you could uh, give $5 and have access. Nevertheless, uh, this, this continuing identity... Yeah. is my principal problem philosophically with Christian physicalism. Because the Christian physicalist, unlike the atheist, wants to say that, that you're going to die and you'll just be dead, because there is no enduring spirit. You'll just be dead, and then at the resurrection, you will, you, your body will be resurrected, and then you'll, like you said, the only problem is... Well, there's more than one. 
what is the case? What? So if I die and my body decays, as bodies that are dead tend to do, and goes into the earth, and even if you say, well, you're in a casket. Okay, well, most of human history has not been in a uh, warranted and <laughs> insured airtight casket, okay? Right. So my body decomposes, goes into the earth. Uh, in fact, it then it then is used as part of vegetation that grows, and other animals eat that vegetation so that in some sense, my body is now a part of some animal body, and we can even conceive, and it's almost certainly has been the case, that my body has now become a part of some other person's physical body, yeah. right? So the me that was there is no longer... If I'm my physical body, that physical body is gone. And even if we wanted to say that God is is just wise enough and powerful enough that he could bring all those atoms and things back together to recreate me, he couldn't do it without taking away from some other person's physical body in, in certain cases. Worse still, uh, we know that now every 17 years, some say 10 years, most, if not all, of the cells of your body have cycled out and replaced themselves so that when you look at your physical hand, you think that you're looking at the same hand with the same scars that were there when you were 10 years old, but it's not. It's literally not the same physical matter that it was. So when you say that you're going to die and your body, including your brain, is going to decompose and then God is going to resurrect that physical body later, that is not a resurrection. That is a recreation of your physical body. But that's not even the worst of it. Would you like to explain the worst of it? Or what I think is the... Would you like to read my mind and explain what I think is the worst of it? No, because what I would like to do is stop now so that the people will become patrons. <laughs> that is a good moment <laughs> there. The, and hear the rest. That is a good moment there. Because but it has I, to do with the enduring self. Yes. That's all we need to yeah. say. Um, but... <laughs> I've been thinking about death, uh, and not because of ghoulish Halloween costumes, but I was thinking about death because a, a good friend of mine recently died, a friend from my uh, post-high school years. Um, he was uh, one of the most genuinely nice people that you'll ever meet. Um, he also looked like Fabio, like literally. He was like the best-looking man in Central Arkansas at the time. Oh, yeah. So if you're a young man who looks more like me and less like Fabio and you want to meet women, it's good to be his friend. You know, uh, his name was John Hayes and he hung around our band a lot. Uh, not like a, I mean, he, he like helped carry stuff and he really liked our band and he, and he liked a lot of bands. Uh, but that's not why he was our friend, but he was just, he hung out with our band a lot and he actually would perform a song where I would get, get to not have to, I get a breather, right? Because mm -hmm. I was the front man. And yes, it's true. Front men work uh, harder than anybody but the drummer um, as far as trying to put on a, you know, physical exertion that, 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 that puts on a, a show for people. So it was a good chance for me to take a break. And he performed this song. It was a silly song. It was called Fatty Bumbalatty. And he just kept repeating that. What was it? Yeah. Fatty Bumbalatty. What does that mean? Well, uh, I don't know. Never mind. Just move on. <laughs> it's like the people who use banana uh, in a song to because they, you can just say banana over and over. Okay. Or watermelon. You know, watermelon, watermelon. Fatty Bumbleatty. Yeah, and he would just repeat it over and over. Uh, if you don't keep working out, that's what I'm going to call you. Yes. Um, but hey, five miles a day, minimum. Five miles a day? Is that a Five number? miles a day. Oh, five miles five a day. Five miles a day, a okay. minimum. But anyway, and you're slimming down nicely. Yeah, thank you. So, Fatty Bumble Addy. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, and by the way, this is the second friend of mine from high school that has died in a motorcycle accident. Mm. So, and he was wearing a helmet, no alcohol involved or anything like that. You know, he was just, Really? Yeah. That is very unusual. Yeah. But I've had two friends die in motorcycle. One, uh, uh, a few years ago, and uh, it was in a, uh, a crash that involved other vehicles, but... This this was just he was on his own and it just lost control and okay yeah so Let's so louder yeah so in fact it's interesting that you know I I with 
my dad dying and my mom's mom dying and my uncle dying all within 11 month period of each other. And then having had several friends from high mm -hmm. school pass away two by motorcycle, but others just various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, it's starting to get, you know, where people in your life, you start losing more, you know, it's like what, uh, and, uh, that terrible, the worst Indiana Jones movie, uh, where it says you get, you know, they're sitting in the office. You mean and, the least incredible Indiana Jones movie? No, Temple it's, of Doom? No, not Temple of Doom. Crystal Skull. Oh, surely you're not talking about the Crystal Skull. Yes. Where it says you're... That movie is fantastic. No. Uh, it's... Okay. It, it's the worst one. But anyway, where they're sitting in Andy's office and, you know, they're talking about how you're at that point in life where you start... More gets taken off. Yes, the it, fantastic you know? scene where they're talking about how... Um, how his father yeah. uh, is gone, and then Marcus yeah. Brody has now died. Yeah. And and, and a he, fantastic scene. And he says something to the effect of we're now... The uh, third greatest Indian jazz yeah. movie. Go ahead. Okay. But anyway, I'm sorry. But started, you're, you're realizing that. I'm realizing that, that you more love. and more, yeah, more and more the older I get. And I, I know I'm not like your dad's age or, or whatever, and so some people out there, you're still young, right? But you start to you start to take stock in the fact that a lot of people that you know and you've loved and that were a part of your lives uh, are no longer around. Yeah, but it is true that in your case, the people that were that you just mentioned that you that you listed were not people that just got really old and died. They are people that died in uh, accidents or in your father's case because of cancer. Uh, an, a cancer and same with my uncle that, that died. Um, yeah, the only one out of that. That I the ones that I listed was my mom's mom who died just of, of you know being elderly and sick. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, my dad, my uncle, both died of cancer uh, and these motorcycle accidents and, and all these other different things. And you know, I've had certain health issues with my heart lately. You know, and so I, death. I start to think about it a lot more. You yeah. Know? Well, and and to tell you, you know, um, everything that I'll reference from my computer today is uh, I've got open my book here. Death is a doorway. Um, By the way, which is my favorite Braxton Hunter book. I've, I've, well, I've said that. Plenty thank of you. Uh, you should go buy it. it. Well, I've sold more copies of it than any other book. Sure. Although it was the second book I wrote it came out in two thousand nine, so that's. It's had almost ten years to, to accumulate sales, <laughs> yeah. but the but but uh, they really took did, off when I started telling people that it was my favorite. But the reason I the reason I wrote that book is what you are experiencing now. I experienced in my twenties, and the reason is not because I'm so advanced, but rather because my father has a rare genetic blood disease where if he gets a tooth knocked out, he could bleed to death. If he falls and scrapes his knee, he could bleed to death. Yeah. It's called Von Willebrand's and he has a, a stage of Von Willebrand's that when people have it, they don't live to be as long as him, like nobody does, because he's the oldest living person that they know of who has Von Willebrand's to the degree that he has it. So throughout my whole life, I've been, to, and I don't have it, and my children don't have it, even though it's a genetic disease, um, but all all throughout my life, I've been told every single year, you know, your dad might not be with us next year. Your dad might not be here next year. Your yeah. dad could die any time. And that really worked on me and made me really begin to think a lot about death a lot more. Now, it had the positive benefit of making me appreciate my parents more than I think most kids appreciate their parents. But in my late 20s, as I began to really, I remember one day I was standing, I think I maybe mentioned this, I don't know recently, but I was standing in my driveway here in Evansville and I was looking at a dead bird yeah. and I thought to myself, that bird is dead. The neuron stopped firing, the heart stopped pumping blood and it just ceased to exist. Unless you're one of those people that thinks that animals are going to, you know, that your animals are going to be in heaven, <laughs> like the specific animals. Um, and so obviously there'll be animals. But so anyway, um, I, I got to thinking on that, and, and, and here's the strange thing, and I mentioned this kind of like last week. We're getting more personal here lately. Yeah. Uh, but one, one of the and things, our viewership is <laughs> <one of> the <laughs> But the, the interesting thing about it is, um, even though I had all the apologetics, and even though I know everything about this subject and all, 
I still had this temptation. It was like a cold hand on my shoulder saying, you know, what William Lane Craig said as he looked at his father dying, that it was like a cold hand was on his shoulder saying, this will be you one day. Yeah. And I think I had something like that. And I, and it really bothered me, even though I knew all the answers spiritually, I was still bothered by the idea of death. And ultimately I wrote a book on the subject to put down what the Bible has to say and what I could gather from science and philosophy on it. And so it's death is a doorway. You know, what was actually really helpful to me, obviously the scripture was comforting, but one thing that was really comfortable, comforting to me was the idea that death is merely a doorway that you go through to somewhere else. And there's actually empirical scientific evidence today about that. And we've never talked about it on the show. I don't think in near death experiences. Yeah. Do you want to say anything about near death experiences so that they don't think I'm just one of these loons that believes in near death? Yeah. I mean, let's, let's, let's near death. Let's unpack the word near right. death. Right. Cause this is not, some people want to take near death experiences and lump them in with tourism, heaven tourism, hell tourism type stuff. This is not that. Um, so unfortunately, because some of that tourism stuff, you know, gets easily debunked or recanted in some cases, you know, um, some people want to look at anything like this and roll their eyes and say, Oh brother, here we go. You know, yep. I, you know, he spent 15 minutes in hell or 20 minutes in heaven or whatever. Right. No, 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 no. This is not, or they'll bad. say, or they'll say, you know, the Bible teaches it's appointed unto man once to die. Yeah. Once to die. And after that, the judgment. And as I told a group in, uh, uh, San Angelo just last week, I said, yeah, that's why we call this a near death experience and not a complete death experience. <laughs> right. Dummy. That's a, that's a difference there. You didn't right. say dummy, did you? I did, but I was speaking to a proverbial person and not a person who actually raised that concern. Right. So I got away with it. Yeah. So anyway. But uh, weird things can happen. Yeah. Do, like, do you Close. believe? Do you believe? It's like when people roll their eyes at the idea that someone might be experienced demonic oppression, be experiencing demonic oppression. They're like, oh, brother. Okay. Well, hold on a second. Do you believe Christianity is true? If you believe Christianity is true, these are system dependent beliefs, as well as the idea that you will survive death. Right. Right. So it might be interesting for people to know that according to a 1982 Gallup poll, 5% of the general population in the United States had undergone a near death experience. That was around 8 million people then. Now 5% is closer to 15 million people. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Probably 15 million people in the U S claiming to have had this experience, an experience like this. This alone should be reason enough to give NDEs a second look near death experiences. Um, many of these met, meet the requirements that I'm going to lay out. One example is the research done in 1998 involving congenitally blind patients who were able to see for the first time during their near death experience. Just imagine these individuals were born blind for the first time, were able to describe the images of the world that seem so common to everyone else. Regarding the same study, uh, there's a book by Dinesh D'Souza, uh, people, people could maybe rightly roll their eyes at Dinesh D'Souza, <laughs> but uh, he explains, quote, they could give detailed descriptions of their medical procedures and even identify the jewelry and the colors of clothing of people around them. So this evidence is kind of hard to ignore. Yeah. People that can have never seen anything. I mean, you can just be dismissive of it if you want to, but at sure. this point, you're just being obtuse, right? Right. Yeah. It, so I, I think. Go ahead. Well, it, it there, there's a certain lack of curiosity that has kind of swept over culture, and I think it has a lot to do with new atheism. So new atheism, not sophisticated philosophical atheists. They're typically a little bit more. Like you're referring to people that like deny Jesus ever existed type people. Well, either those people are even Sam Harris or um, you told me to go watch a debate uh, or not a debate, but a hallway conversation with one of my old professors and this long haired guy. And yeah, you're talking about R.N. Raw yeah, versus Dr. John Mark, John Reynolds. Mark Reynolds. Yeah, and I watched that with because I'd never seen that. That's pretty fun, wasn't it? Right, and and so. That guy, Aaron Raw or whatever, yeah. 
he's one of those bumper sticker atheists that could not understand what the other guy was talking about because they, they have this posture of being simply everything that's not science is irrational. And that's the dumbest he that's the dumbest claim you could ever make. And, I, yeah. and, and that was kind of the claim. A claim that is not scientific. Right. Uh, but they're not intelligent enough to understand the nonsense that's coming out of their mouths. But because of that, but I think some of that has seeped in even into just the way people think nowadays and in general, but that, that our first instance is anything that is out of our everyday experience, you know, out of our normal everyday experience is to be not just suspicious about it, but cynical about it. Yeah. And that's intellectually a disaster. Well, and even, to not be curious is a disaster. I, I, I you know, it, it's that's just bad. Well, and even for the church, there is a certain category of paranormal type stuff yeah. that we rightly want to say, that's not us. Right. Don't be saying that we're like, you know, uh, flat earthers. Don't be saying that we're like, you know, people that claim to be abducted by aliens. Although that's a weird phenomenon. <laughs> don't yeah. don't put us in this category with everything else X Files. It's not like that. Right. This is what people have believed for two thousand years. Yeah. Uh, philosophically trained, scientifically trained. Everybody from the highest of minds to the beggar on the street. Every there's there's all kinds of people. So don't put us in the category with these minority weird situations yeah. um and however because no the church, offense, matt i mean you know we got because the church does that the, what ends up happening is the church itself because the individuals yeah. within the church find it difficult to parse out wait a minute hold on i think in that mass of paranormal x-file stuff this one right here might be there's actually something to this right, right? especially when we're talking about an issue where what kind of evidence do you want it's experiential. The people can tell you about it. It's also empirical. Yeah. Uh, it's repeatable. It, there's all kinds of interesting things about yeah. this that take it out of that world and into something that is a little bit more serious. It's in the medical journals. People are having to take it seriously. Yeah. So I. So let me give you an example of my favorite one, just to kick us off. Okay. I about a year ago, a little over a year ago, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and I got a call from Mike Lycona, famous New Testament scholar, who. Was, Look at this name drop. He, he called me out of the said, blue just to say what's up. No, he called me out of the blue to say, would you like to come to my house? Because Oh, even better. Gary Habermas is there. Right. Look, <laughs> look at all this name dropping. Well, I, I'm not trying to name drop. Drop. I'm just telling you what happened. So anyway, so I go there. Braxton Hunter went shooting with Mike Lacona. Uh, yeah. And he says that he, what, you th who, who did better? Oh, he. I'm sure he did better. Yeah. But you said you you were. Proud I of your, shocked him with I think how well I. Did. Oh, you were better than he thought you would. Yeah, be. yeah, yeah, yeah. But so anyway, um, I don't know if you wanted me telling about that. But anyway, uh, so but I will tell about this. So I go to Mike's house, and I walk in, and there is Gary Habermas, who for a young guy getting into apologetics. Yeah. It's Gary Habermas. Come on, you know. So Gary Habermas says, you know, shakes my hand or anything. We go to sit in the living room. He's like, hey, I'm going to make some coffee. Will you want me to make you some coffee? And I'm like, Gary Habermas is making my coffee. That's <laughs> awesome. But we sit down and talk. And what's funny is I had listened to some of his near-death experience uh, research because that's what he's done a lot of that. Yeah. And he started telling me a story thinking I'd never heard it. And I was correcting details in Gary Habermas's own story, yeah, because I know that story better than he does. Because that's I told what him. he wants you to say on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a tribute to Gary Habermas that yeah. I've listened to that that much. So anyway, uh, but the story that that he told me that then I told back to him correctly <laughs> was this one. I corrected Gary Habermas the day I met him. Well, that's on his own story, <laughs> okay. But here's here's the story, and this this has always stuck with me. I think this is powerful. So he was at uh, I don't know maybe UCLA. Uh, giving this talk on near-death experiences and over on the uh, and it's all medical doctors mm -hmm. and medical professionals and so he's telling this story uh, telling one of the telling some things about near-death experiences and this uh, this woman who's the wife of an ear nose and throat doctor stands up on this side of the crowd and says I can tell you all about it if you want to know what heaven is like because I've been there and so everyone looked at her the way you're all looking at the computer screen right now, like, you know. There's that tourism stuff. Yeah. 
And he says, and, and he says, oh, and after a few moments, this uh, uh, female atheist oncologist over on the other side of the crowd stands up and says, well, then don't just stand there. Tell us about it. And so she said, I was, I had already given birth to two children and I knew them and loved them. And I was pregnant with a third son and I bled out on the table and they declared me dead. Now, this is not saying she was actually dead. This is, um, you know, clinical death or what, whatever the term is. Mostly dead. Yeah, she was mostly dead. <laughs> but she had no brainwave and no heart rate and all that. You know, it's, she they thought she was dead and uh, and all that. So she was later resuscitated, but she said while she was in that uh, experience, she said, I was in a place, and she said, I'll try to tell you about it. And she said, the color. I can tell you about the color. And then she stopped herself and said, no, because when I say color, you're thinking of blue and red and green. These are colors like the human eye can't perceive. And then she said, well, I could tell you about the music. And then she stopped herself and said, no, because when I tell you about music, you're, you're thinking of Mozart or Beethoven. This is nothing, or maybe you too. This is nothing like that. She didn't say that. This is nothing like that. This is music that no human has ever produced. And she said, I guess I just can't tell you about it. And then he said, let me ask you this. You, it, you say that you had these two sons and one child that you'd carried for nine months but had not yet held in your arms. It's my understanding that the bond between a mother and her child is the strongest bond that two human beings can have. Many mothers say that. And he said, if, if you'd had your way, would you have stayed there or would you have come back? And she looked at the ground and began to cry and pointed at her husband without looking up and said, he could raise our children. I would have never left that place. Now, you, you, you ask the question, yeah, but did that really happen to her? I don't know. But if what Christian scripture says is true, to be in the presence of God, the presence of Jesus, to, you know, in this experience beyond the grave, would be totally consistent with, ten. it'd be 10,000 times greater than anything she could put into words, which is what she was having trouble doing. It was ineffability. She could not describe it. Now, was that real? I don't know. It doesn't meet any of the criteria that I'm about to give you. I only tell you that one for the sense of wonder that I yeah. think it does evoke about this. When I, I've constructed a list for my purposes that a near-death experience has to meet these criteria in order for us to consider it evidential, okay? So here, are, here they are. It has to be documented by a medical doctor or nurse. So it has to be documented by a, a, a medical professional, all right? It can't be just a, just a, a hearsay thing has to be documented, number two, shortly after the patient was resuscitated. We're not going to hear about this a month later. Right. You need to tell about it because that, by that point, you can add, it becomes a fishtail. Uh, three, it has to be testable. There are at least two ways that an NDE, NDE may be tested. A number of patients have described events that have occurred or objects that were present in the room and sometimes miles away from the hospital while they were unconscious. To a lesser degree, NDEs can be validated if they contain many of the common elements of near-death accounts that we'll talk about later. However, the latter is less reliable in that the patient may have previously been aware of typical near-death elements. So it's testable if they're talking about a lot of stuff they wouldn't have been able to know about that happened while they were unconscious and no brainwave activity. But it also is to a lesser degree... See, that's also the key. Yeah. No brainwave activity. Because if there's no brainwave activity, you can't just say this is the, the, the brain shooting a bunch of images Right? That's right, yeah. Right. There are some NDEs that don't require, in order to be evidential, I don't think, no Zero. brainwave activity. Right. For example, you might be in a room and have no and, and have brainwave activity, but no but but you're unconscious. But if you're able to tell me about something that happened in another part of the hospital or a sticker that is above the light in the room you're in, or something on the roof of the hospital, that's still evidential, I think. Yeah. Um, but but anyway, and then the fourth one must lo must be logically consistent because as we try to point out to people that all the time this comes up with the Bible, this comes up with historiography. If something is not logically consistent, if it's contradictory, then guess what? It's not true. Right. Right. Um, so those those are the criteria. So it must be logically consistent, testable, documented shortly after the patient was resuscitated, and by a medical uh, professional, preferably. Uh, it's even better if it's an atheist medical professional, yeah. right? And we have cases like that. They're in the uh, medical journals. Yeah. So, so uh, 
with that kind of criteria, this is not just, oh, this is the X-File episodes. I mean, right. this is not the Bible bro down, folks. No, I'm just kidding. I don't want to be. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, no, but but um, these are. This is interesting phenomenon yeah. that you cannot simply dismiss out of hand. Yeah. Now you can still walk away from this, and because of other worldview things that you may have as an atheist, not put much stock in it. Yeah. But just to dismiss it without having reasoned everything through, because you have to account for the phenomenon, and you have to account for the phenomenon on your worldview. That's right. And does your worldview have a way to account for this if you believe it? Now, if you're going to be cynical and just flippantly dismiss it, okay, but you have the, the, the science saying you can't just dismiss it. Right. How do you explain this phenomenon? Right. This is scientific data. Right. How, do you, how does this person who's in a hospital has no idea what's in the other room on the other side of the hospital has no idea what's on the roof. Uh -huh. Maybe doesn't even live in the city. I don't know what's on the roof. What we're thirteen floors up. We have a medical center out here. I don't know what's on the roof. Yeah, you know. So how do you explain that? It, you, it needs an explanation. Saying that, well, it can't be this. This. It, well, why can't it be that? That. Right. So you you've got to. You're culling that away because it's supernatural. Right. You're not allowed to do that. We got to follow the evidence wherever it leads. Right. And this is scientific data right. that I think plays into this. Does it prove Christianity? No, but that's not what we're saying. No, but, but it I'm, is a piece of data that Christianity has the resources to explain. Right. That's right. So um, I don't. I don't know how you account for this on atheism. So here's an example of one that I think meets all the criteria. Um, Dr. Michael Sabom recorded what some believe to be conclusive proof of the afterlife as he described the story of Pam Reynolds. Reynolds was undergoing brain surgery to remove a basilar artery aneurysm. Uh, an extremely dangerous neurosurgical technique was performed in Pam's case. Sabom explains hypothermic cardiac arrest, thusly. This operation, nicknamed standstill by the doctors who performed it, would require that her body temperature be lowered to 60 degrees, her heartbeat and breathing stopped, her brain waves flattened, and the blood drained from her head. In everyday terms, she would be dead. Pam Reynolds experienced something that would change her life. She reported many of the heavenly elements that are common among NDEs, but we're not considering those. None of the four criteria I gave have anything to do with that, that stuff. The heaven tourism stuff, right? But what catches our attention are the things Pam claimed to witness in the operating room when she was in no position to observe them. She described conversation, conversations that she shouldn't have been able to hear or recall. However, her ability to describe what she heard is eclipsed by what she saw. Following the surgery, she was able to describe the unique bone saw that was used during the procedure. She claimed that it, quote, looked like an electric toothbrush and it had a dent in it, a groove at the top where the saw appeared to go into the handle, but it didn't. And the saw had interchangeable blades too, but these blades were in what looks like a socket wrench case. Because the bone saw was being used on her head, Pam wouldn't have been able to see it even if she had been conscious. Some have posited that she may have been able to hear the saw and imagine what it may have looked like. However, the description above is incredibly detailed. It is prohibitively unlikely that she could have guessed its appearance. After all, she was, quote, in everyday terms, dead, end quote. Yeah, my only problem with that is she may have had prior knowledge of what. Yeah, now that's a possibility. She could have had prior knowledge of that, but that's the great thing about this. The I have no idea is, what a bone saw is. The bone <laughs> saw is only one piece of it, too. She yeah. also was able to recount conversations yeah. that took place when she had her brain waves flattened and the bl blood drained from her head. Yeah. Okay. No, I get <laughs> so, that. You know, yeah, so. I don't know what a bone yeah. saw looks like myself. Yeah. I'm going to Google it the first thing when this is over. <laughs> right, right, right. But, uh, yeah, so uh, there are going to be things that, that you could probably pick at. Yeah. But you have to account for all of the data. Right, and it's like, okay, can you pick if it was just in this, all of these cases and right. there's millions of them? Yeah. 15 million? Right. Yeah. It, that, it, make that your job. Right. You start a GoFundMe <laughs> account and go debunk all 15 million. Yeah. Uh, there's a really interesting case that Gary Habermas talks about, and I asked him when I was with him at Mike Lycona's home. Um, if when Gary Habermas made Mike Lacona has never invited me to his home. The most I get but, is a, a phone call every so often. So, so the, so the thing is, 
uh, or a Facebook message. There's a particularly interesting case where um, a guy, uh, these two guys had gone to the same church, a pastor and one of the congregants. Yeah. But they had lost touch with each other and they lived in separate parts of the country. And so one was in like North Carolina, the other in Florida. And they both had tragic accidents of some sort or other on the same day and were both unconscious in separate hospitals, states away. And again, they hadn't talked with each other in forever. When both of them were resuscitated, both of them immediately recounted that they had just been in the presence of the other one having a particular conversation yeah. and were able to recount the details of the conversation. And this was all written up and their stories matched. Now, I, now see, this is where like, I don't know how much more you need to call that proof. Yeah. You know, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the explanation? You know, what, how do you get around that? That's why I told uh, Gary Havanagh, I said, whenever I tell these stories in conferences and stuff, people act like, oh, this is ridiculous. And he's like, yeah, they can do that. They, they can act like it's ridiculous, but have them try to compete with the evidence because the evidence is powerful, you know? Yeah. So do you, do you want to try to shoot holes in any of these? No. Well, I'm trying to, implications. Uh, implications of this, well, for, for one thing, if near-death experiences bear out, that seems to be a severe blow to materialism. Oh, yeah. You could still be an atheist of a sort. Like maybe you could be like some kind of a Buddhist atheist. But a naturalistic atheist, I, I don't see how that works on this. Yeah, I don't, I don't see how it works. Or Christian physicalism, for that matter. Or but Christian physicalism. possibly work on this. And yeah. unless you're... The only thing that I, okay, so in ancient uh, Greece, some of the philosophers would think that if you were talking about spirit, you were talking about something that was material, just highly refined matter, right? So I suppose if you wanted to have a physical self and then a more refined, you know, material self, yeah. You can still say, well, that's all one You're thing. You're saying, what if the spirit has some sort of a material, it's very physical, light material? Yeah, yeah, it's very refined. It's it, it maybe even translucent or transparent, but it, it's still matter. Yeah. Um, so maybe you could pull that off. And I don't know the field of physicalism to know if they posit anything. I don't think they currently have a science of spirit like that. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe someone's working on it. Well, I mean, I believe that like angels and demons, I, yeah. I believe that they are physical in a sense. I'm okay with that. I always just say they manifest, they can manifest physically. Yeah. Because the Bible tells us that they are spirit. It uses the same word for God's spirit that yeah. it uses for them. And we don't say God has a physical body, but... It might be that that was just using the language that was most efficient for communicating. Right, the but idea. even in the, but the background, of, at least in the New Testament, that word was flexible enough that, you know, at least with the, the, the Greeks, they, they would think of a highly refined matter, but it wasn't it wasn't necessarily in, immaterial, even if yeah. it was, uh, I don't know if I'm using it. You're it's saying it's a material thing. Yeah. It's, That's just very light material. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I don't know how, how to explain it, but yeah, it's very refined. Very. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So I, I don't. A physical is. That's what say. Mormons say about the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. So so yeah, but yeah, you know, it's nothing new here. You're Mormon. <laughs> Not me. No. No, I'm saying that would be a way to try to retain a physicalism, yeah. but that's not talking. But that's that's not that's not monism. And that's not what any of these people say. Right. It's that's not, not what, what the naturalist atheists say. It's, it's not, what, not what the Christian physicalists right. say. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But you could you couldn't retain the monism because it's that's a separate thing that can ex extend beyond. The, so yeah. The, so the, the, the firmer physical body. These are two so, big reasons why. Number one, I'm not a, a materialist atheist, yeah. but also why I'm not a Christian physicalist because they I think it's they one of the many reasons why that's a. Well, that, like, I think they have big problems with this because I think this is real. Identity, yeah. And then they have the problem that Become is, a patron. is in our patron. Become a patron. I'm doing the Leighton Flowers. No more. This <laughs> yeah. is, this is pay. You have to pay for that. The other reason not to be a physicalist. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. Someone's going to become a physicalist now because we didn't tell them free of the Can't let it shit me. Okay. No. What are some commonalities of these near death encounters? Because it's interesting. You can give a dollar. It's interesting. We when, have patrons who give a dollar. Yeah, sure. That's not even a cup of coffee. They don't get everything that all the patrons get. But no, but yeah. they do get that episode. But here's the thing. You get some of my old songs. When things... Did you put some of your old songs on here? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Maybe I need to become a patron. <laughs> so the thing is, when you have commonalities with a particular phenomenon, that lends credibility too. That's one. Of, that's the lighter way that I said these things are testable. Obviously, the best way they're testable is if they're able to talk, talk about stuff they shouldn't be known about. But another way is if they meet the commonalities, right? Yeah. So what are some of these commonalities? And if you want to stop me and talk about yeah. specific ones of these, you can. Ineffability beyond the limits of language to describe. That we saw in the case of the mother yeah. um, situation. Hearing yourself pronounced dead. <laughs> that happens a lot. Um, feelings of peace and quiet. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> right? I had to wait to experience a near-death encounter. Um, hearing unusual noises. Seeing a dark tunnel. Finding yourself outside your body, meeting spirit. See that things. right there, finding mm -hmm. yourself outside of your body. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that, so I can have a dream where I'm looking at myself from a uh -huh. third pers person perspective, right? Uh -huh. I can have that kind of dream. For those of you that can't hear because you won't speak up, he said he could have a dream in third I person. I could have a dream where I'm imagining viewing myself from a third party perspective. Right. That's right. From a third person perspective. Yeah. Is that better? A little bit, yeah. When you when you edit this, you're going to see the big spike. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Um, you can have a dream from third person, but you can't have a personal experience awake right. from third person. Right. A waking experience. Now, somebody is going to get philosophical and say, how can you tell the difference between a dream and reality? Okay, no. Um, but I can imagine what that's like, but the what it's likeness of the experience of what it's like, no. Because if I could actually consciously look at myself, that'd be weird. Yeah. That's not like a dream where you're looking at yourself, but there's also a dragon behind you right. you know, or something crazy going on. Right. Um, you're having an experience like this, where all of a sudden I'm looking down and I'm seeing, you know, maybe if that's the case, I've, I've kicked over and you're trying to revive me and I'm sitting here looking at this whole incident and I'm like, and it's like this experience now. Mm -hmm. That to me is weird. It to me also, it, it's, you've just found about 10 different ways to say that's weird. <laughs> it, here's the bigger thing. It's, it sounds plausible. It sounds plausible, yeah. And, and that's what maybe is what we what's so weird about it is like that one. I'm like, you know, I could because to be able to have that kind of experience, it would not be like recounting a dream right. that you have. Right. It is a fundamentally different kind of experience. Also, another one is a very bright light experienced as a being of light, not a beam of light, a being of light. Now, here's the interesting thing. Sometimes skeptics will discount these because, and even Christians will discount these near death encounters because they'll say, well, first of all, they'll ignore the criteria I set out. But then secondly, they'll say, yeah, but Muslims have Muslim near death experiences. Jews have Jewish near death, you know, and so on and so forth. But that's because you can have an experience of something and interpret it according to your worldview. Right. right. It's not like the being of light has a name tag necessarily. So if a Muslim has a near death experience and encounters a being of light, <laughs> what are they going to think? Well, this is Allah or something, or maybe this is the exalted highest prophet Muhammad or something, you know, uh, uh or Jesus, a, a Jewish person might say, well, this is the very essence of Yahweh. This is what Moses encountered on the hillside, you yeah. know, or, or, or we might say this is Jesus. You know, so the, th this is why we don't go to this to prove Christianity is true, because it can get subjective like that. Yeah. We go to near-death experiences to demonstrate that naturalism has a big problem and to comfort people that it does seem like some of the best science says you survive death, right? Yeah. So, so that's an interesting, uh, so being of light. 
But it is a, in a cumulative case, it is a piece of data sure. that needs to be accounted for. Which is how I use it. Yeah. A panoramic life review. You know, you ever heard someone say, I have my whole life flash before my eyes? Yeah. Well, interestingly, a panoramic life review is a, a commonality. I'm just giving you commonalities. I'm not saying that each one of these things really happened. That's not this point. What I'm saying here is these are common these are features common. among the yeah. 15 million reported. Right, right. that's right. Yeah. Sensing a border or limit to where you can go. You know, like if you go any further, you can't go back type thing. Or you just can't go any further. Uh, coming back into your body. Frustrated attempts to tell others about what happened to you. <laughs> I'll bet. Because <laughs> you come up and you're like, I was just in the, this amazing place. They're like, oh, are you talking about a near-death experience? Oh, brother. You know, because <laughs> nobody believes you. Um, subtle broadening and deepening of your life afterward. Elimination of the fear of death. That is, that's worth having. Well, you know, there's one, I hesitate to tell this one. A particular person who will remain, remain nameless, who is highly credible, told me about they were researching and they encountered this guy who had been like a, a, a marathon runner. And he had had a near-death experience. And so this particular researcher went to talk with him to interview him about this. The guy was willing to interview. The guy kept wanting to meet at IHOP for every interview. And the guy was grossly obese, really unhealthy, and just shoveling the food down. And so he says, finally, at some point, the researcher says, I got to ask you something. You were a marathon runner in great shape, like at the epitome of health. And now this is what you look like. He's like, it's very simple. I have absolutely no fear of death. So I'm going to do whatever I want and die whatever I want. This basically was the thing. Now, I don't even, it, that guy may not have even been, you know, that's, that's not saying that's what you should do. Okay. Right. That's, we should appreciate the bodies that we have that God gave us and maintain them well. It's not like people that have had near death experiences are now sinless, right? He right. was, that we could call that sin, but that's to show the lack of fear of death yeah. that this guy had. I've heard people say they actually look forward to death after this. Uh, corroboration of events witnessed while outside of your body, a realm where all knowledge exists, and interestingly, cities of light. Cities of light. So, uh, there's some commonalities for you. Uh, real quick, uh, let me give you what the commonalities among children who have near-death experiences. It's a shorter list. Now, these are children who've had near-death experiences. Commonalities. A powerful need to have a home, quote unquote, even if it's only their own bedroom. An equally important desire to have an altar of some kind in their home. Anything on the altar is holy to them. An intense curiosity about God, worship, and prayer. Many insist that their parents take them to a house of worship. An unusual sensitivity to whatever is hurtful or to lies especially as reflected in world events, the media, and in white lies parents and siblings occasionally tell. And finally, a shift toward becoming fast talkers and fast thinkers with a driving need to create, invent, read, and learn. Hmm. Commonalities among children. Again, none of those things prove Christianity, but they are very hospitable yeah. to Christianity. Why would this kid want to have an altar? Why, why would that be a commonality to have... A place in their room that's like an altar, unless maybe they were in a place that had an altar. Yeah. It seemed important. <laughs> you know, so, I don't know, something like that. Yeah. yeah or something like an altar, New Covenant, Old Covenant. <laughs> so, pulling some threads together for this. Okay. Because right? I could go on it for ages and you can oh, tell. Oh, yeah, I know. But death. And what, interestingly, death is something that everyone's going to think about. When you talk about your book, you thought about it in the context, not of your own death, but your father's death that could, uh, theoretically, everyone could go at any second. But but that led to my concern. But this was an impending, this just like a dark cloud that hung around because it was always, not in the sense of, oh, I could, you never know if you could get hit by a bus, but literally, you never know if you cut yourself shaving kind of thing, right? Sure. Or your heart could just stop any time. Yeah. No, I'm talking about with your dad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Dad could bleed out any time. Right. So it's not like just the normal irrational fear right. that, that, that keeps people like me from ever going anywhere else of my home. You know, it's, it's, the, it's the very realistic thing for you that, well, 
literally any sort of accident could cause him to bleed out because he's a bleeder. Mm -hmm. And so you think about death, and for me, death is not something that we should fear, but it's something that you're going to fear uh, in the sense of, you know, you shouldn't, but you can fear the unknown. You can fear, you can fear for those who will be left behind when you leave. Let's say you're, you're, you're completely confident that, oh, I don't fear death for me. I'm going to be in the presence of Jesus, but my wife's going to be without income. My kids are going to be without their father, blah, 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 blah. So there are, there are issues. whatever fears you have yeah. or doubts to connect it with last week's episode. Yeah. Death amplifies those. Right. And so death is something we are. And that's why, you know, in scripture, um, Paul refers to it as the last enemy. Right. And, and death is th itself is kind of personified in Revelation as being tossed into the lake of fire. Death. It's, you know, we focus a lot on the sin problem. I think the sin problem with Adam brought death into the world. And because death was in the world, now there's all kinds of sin in the world. Mm -hmm. And so at least that's what he says in Romans five twelve. if you interpret it properly. I, lo I love yeah. that. This is so Pritchett. It's like, let's take one of the most difficult passages in all the Bible that has led to more interpretive disputes. Yeah. And you're like, Here's what it means. Yeah, here's what Duh. it means. Yeah. Does it clearly say that? Well, <laughs> no, I'm just saying if you take that and oh, you I agree take all you. of the emphasis on death, I, we don't, there's a problem in the church that, that we don't take deaths, the enemy death, as seriously as we should. Yeah. You know? Uh, we're fooled by society to think that physical death is the worst imaginable thing. Right. It's why. We constantly get criticisms and questions everywhere I go and on this very show when we've called for questions about the atrocities of the Old Testament and Noah and the flood and little children dying and things like that because of this false belief that death is the end, number one, and that death is the worst imaginable thing, number two. And it's not either. Right. It's not the end and it's not the worst possible thing. Hell, yeah. pick your flavor. Pick... pick. <laughs> Annihilation is bad. Well, even eternal even, conscious torment in a fiery torture chamber is bad. This eternal darkness, separation, wallowing in shame. How, however you want to slice but even that not, up. Even if you want to take hell out of it. Yes, hell is probably the worst imaginable thing. That's the worst. But imaginable. taking even hell out of it, there are plenty of things that people experience in life that are worse than death. You know? You know? Uh, it takes take people that have certain infirmities or certain problems or certain uh, ongoing chronic pain. Uh, there are some things that, that, or even people close to the end of their lives, that they are going to die, but we're keeping them alive, and their yeah. state is sometimes, now I'm not getting into like somebody who's in a coma and that whole debate, that's not what I'm talking about, but people who, for them, they're, it's agony, and what do we say when they die? Is, well, now at least they're now at peace. Yes, right? and that was yeah. true of my father dying, yeah. you know, um, I, I let my father down in this sense. He told me that if it got bad enough and he started losing his mind and all that, that I was supposed to blow his head off with a pistol. Now, I well, didn't that do that. that. Well, you couldn't well do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But, but he, he, you know, he said he would rather be gone than yeah. not be able to recognize my right. mom, not be able to recognize us and all that. And he didn't get that way until near the end. But, you know, uh, that's, that to me is worse than death. Watching someone die of cancer slowly, stage four lung cancer, what yeah. that does, and the treatment being as, you know, the cure worse than the disease and all of that stuff. You know, it's, there are things worse than death on sure. this side of it. There's something, if you don't have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there's something far worse than death on the other side of it. Yeah. So death, and this is why I mean this, death is merely a doorway. Yeah. That's what it is. It just, you're going from one place to the other. And in one sense, our life is a struggle, even as Christians, to remind ourselves of that, that it's not the end and it's not over. And so when I wrote that book, I, I, this not show is not about that book, but when I wrote that book, I was able to then put my hands on it, something tangible that I could say, here's the answers. I, I've got, you say, well, the Bible's the answer. Right. And there's a lot of Bible in that book. But I pulled together the science, the philosophy, yeah. the Bible, and I could say this, I settled this problem for myself. 
And you know what? It's pretty well been resolved for me. Yeah. It may help you. You may not agree with it. It helped me. This is the best I can do. And to me, it helped. So I think what, what I, 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 I'm, I'm actually being serious when I say it's my favorite book of, of, of yours. Um, so buy it. It's not that expensive. Uh, and, to quote, and to quote from, to quote from um, Peter Pan, yeah. to die will be an awfully big adventure. And to quote from Socrates, no one knows whether death may not be the greatest of all blessings. Right. Of course, I'm not drinking hemlock, baby, and for him, I'm not sure it was. <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I hope this has been enjoyable to you. This week, I wanted to discuss um, uh, Jesus outside of the Bible well, we'll and other sources. Next so next week, um, hopefully, we'll discuss Jesus in other early material ancient literature outside of the Bible. Is he outside of the Bible? I said this to a friend of mine, Adam Powers, who's been on the show. I said, I'm studying Jesus outside the New Testament. He said, well, man, that's a waste of time. You may not know this, but Jesus is in the New Testament. <laughs> so so I, I, we're going to look at Jesus outside yeah. the New Testament, outside the Bible. You will want to be here for that. It's uh, it's going to be incredible. Thanks for listening. Check out the Bible bro down. Uh, All the Steve X-Files you want. On the Narrow the Path. Uh, yeah. Actually, no, that's not fair. The, the fact is, they've gotten away from those episodes, and those were my favorite episodes. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and they're actually just doing theology. So, Teriology One Hundred One, pray for Leighton as he is currently in Malaysia. Yeah, I with Doctor David Allen. Yeah. Um, and if you'd like to become a patron, if you'd like to give to Trinity Radio and get that uh, bonus episode on several bonus episodes, but the one on. Um, what's wrong with Christian physicalism, then uh, you can click up here somewhere and uh, you'll see a little I and you can click that and you can give. If you're listening by audio, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash Trinity Radio and become a supporter that way. We really appreciate it. And most importantly, we yeah, hope we that you all our stuff to pay for his turkey trip. So if, if, if you want us to get back into the studio with a nice mic and all that stuff. And in four days... In four days, The Chronicles of the Adonai, book two, will be available in paperback. So go to Amazon.com, type in Braxton Hunter in four days, and maybe it's there now, I don't know, and go ahead and get a copy. If you haven't begun that series, I know, I know, I know. Most I of our listeners, it. most of our listeners I would say, I don't listen to fiction, I don't read fiction books. Yeah, well, you're not doing yourself any favors. Did you know that most... Uh, successful people read at least one fiction book per month. So I encourage you to stop being so unsuccessful <laughs> and read book one of the Chronicles of the Adonai, which you can get right now. And in four days, you'll be ready to get book two. Yeah, I read it in about six, seven, six and a half hours. Yeah, we had one guy said he read it in two sittings, and he could have read it in one sitting, but he had to eat dinner in between. Right. So, so, I mean, you can knock it out. Yeah. Pretty. Uh, all right, so check that out. Uh, if you want to read more about it, you can go to braxtonhunter.com slash novel. Uh, and then lastly, the most important thing is we want you to be a part of the world's finest seminary and Bible college, Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, where the courses are better than each episode of Trinity Radio. So, by lots. Um, make sure that you check it out. If you just want to audit a class, you know, you can audit individual classes for $35. Maybe you don't know if this is right for you. You know what you can do? You can call us and we will put you in a actual virtual classroom uh, for free and you can listen to a whole bunch of lectures and, and see how it all works without ever becoming a Trinity student just to yeah. see if it's right for you. The thing is we're confident doing that because we know that once you do it you will be a Trinity student. So right. um, contact us today. No, I want to wait till the next semester starts. We don't well, you're doing it wrong. We don't do semesters. Do we start a class first Thursday. Semesters are so 1990s. We don't do that anymore. We do a year-round program that you can get in on today. You just think, today you could call and you could already be working on your program before this day is done. That's correct. Now, who could beat that? Catch us next time on Trinity Radio. Please don't tell me. If you would like more content, click here and keep watching Bible Studies. Click up here. And finally, we want you to subscribe. We need more subscribers, so click here.